Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the St Kilda Town Hall and welcome to the City of Port Phillip. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present and emerging, and we pay our due respect to the traditional owners of this land as we have done for many, many years, which is a good thing. Uh, thank you to our guest speakers that have joined us here this evening. My name is Marcus Pearl. I'm the Mayor of the City of Port Phillip. And I just want to acknowledge my fellow councillors. Councillor Sirikoff is here from Lake Ward and Councillor Bond is also here from Lake Ward. That's it. Uh, Councillor Baxter, Deputy Mayor Baxter is here from Canal Ward. And I think you're the solo Canal Ward uh, person here tonight, Deputy Mayor Baxter. So thank you for coming. And, oh, sorry. And from Gateway Ward, we have Councillor Martin and there may be some other councillors here also. So thank you to our special guests, uh, Sam Hibbins, Nina Taylor, and David Davis, I'm assured, telepathically, is on his way. So I, I hope he will, he'll attend also from the Liberal Party. Um, but before they come together to join us here, I just want to re acknowledge a few people that have brought this event together this evening. The Metropolitan Transport Forum, some of you would be aware of their fantastic work. The City of Port Phillip is a member of the MTF, and we're very proud to do so. And Greg Day is the representative of the MTF here this evening. So Greg deserves a round of applause. So thank you, Greg. <laughs> thank you also to our City of Port Phillip officers and staff. They're the ones that do all the work um, and make us look good or bad. Uh, we appreciate everything you guys have done. So thank you for setting everything up, particularly James. So thank you for going the extra effort and being here this evening. Now, before we start off, I just wanted to run through some priorities um, about the City of Port Phillip in relation to transport and particularly our advocacy items for the upcoming state election. So we'll just switch the slide over. Now, there's a number of projects that we're advocating for at the moment to the state government. First and foremost is uh, the Metro 2 development. So what we would like to see the government do of the day is two main things, two small but very important things. Bring the business case for Metro 2 forward to 2026 and reserve the places they wish to place the station. Now, this is a game-changing project on a social level, an environmental level, and an economic level for the state of Victoria. It connects our social and economic channels from the east to the west. It's another critical river crossing, but importantly, it's the catalytic infrastructure that Port Melbourne needs and Fishman Bend needs to sustain 80,000, a population of 80,000 people and a workforce of 80,000 people in the not too distant future. So two small asks. One is to future proof where the stations will go in the Fishman's Bend precinct. And secondly, is to bring the business case forward to 2026. It's two very small but very important things. The second component is the tram, the wonderful tram that we've been advocating for, for 10 years, the South Side Fisherman's Bend tram to come into connecting the city to the Wirraway precinct and the Sandridge precinct in the Fisherman's Bend area. That requires a river crossing as well, um, but it's a key piece of infrastructure from a transport point of view that this city has been advocating for many years with the city of Melbourne. Now, there's some other items that we need to talk about which are just as important. The next one is some smaller but important ones which are twofold down this end of the city. The first one is the Inkerman Street um, connection, which Nina would know very well because she's a former councillor of the city, city of Glenara. It's a five-kilometre strip uh, between St Kilda Road up to the top end of the top of Caulfield, connecting Caulfield into the superhighway that is St Kilda Road that then runs into the city. It's safety improvements, amenity improvements for trees, traffic improvements, and also the addition of a bike lane. We're looking for funding for the state government to sustain that project also. Other items include the 109 tram duplication, which is the duplication of the tram at the Port Melbourne site. The business case, sorry, detailed design is yet to be done, but we understand that the state government has already done concept design on this project that was completed in 2020 and it's yet to be released. If we duplicate the line at Waterfront Place, it cleans that area up slightly, it provides activity and it also provides much needed additional tram flow into the 109 route 
which is the second most busy tram route in Melbourne. It connects Port Melbourne to Box Hill and everything in between. It's a critical piece of infrastructure. And a small investment at the Port Melbourne end will, will again benefit our whole city. The other items we're looking for is investment in electric, electric vehicle charging stations. Again, this is a no-brainer from an economic point of view. Uh, we understand the growing nature of electronic, uh, electric cars, rather. Uh, Council ha is ready and able to work with the state and federal government for the uh, strategic placement of those charging stations across our city, but particularly also, also foreshore locations. So there's some of the key items we're looking for. Uh, we're working very closely with the state government already on key projects such as Anzac Station, the St Kilda Road bike uh, corridor, which we'd also like to see a small extension on down to the junction area. And those activities have been um, done very, very well in partnership and also our uh, strategy in terms of Live Connect, um, Move Connect Live rather. Sorry, I'm doing pretty well on the top without any notes in front of me. Uh, but our core strategy of Move Connect Live, which details all of these plans and how they integrate together to make our city the most functional one in the city of Melbourne, the most livable one, but also the most sustainable one. So, ladies and gentlemen, tonight is all about a contest of ideas, and that's what politics is about. So you're going to hear from our three candidates tonight. They've got seven minutes to sell their wares to you about how to produce the best outcome for our city. A maximum of seven minutes, Nina. Fine not to you if you don't want to use it. Um, but before I go through uh, the process of what we're going to go through this evening in the ground rules, I'd just like to introduce our wonderful speaker. So Nina Taylor was first elected to the Victorian Parliament at the last election in 2018 as an upper house member uh, for the Australian Labor Party. Nina has a wealth of experience at the state government level and also the local government level being a former councillor of the city of Glenara. She's also a parliamentary secretary. She's now made the brave move to be a candidate in the lower house to attempt to succeed uh, Martin Foley for the lower house seat of Albert Park, who obviously is the majority seat in the city of Port Phillip. Nina, we've loved working with you since you've been in Parliament. We thank you for being here this evening. Round of applause. Let's go. That's it. San Hibbins was first elected uh, to the lower house of the Victorian Parliament in 2014. He is a committed uh, person, particularly to social justice and the environment. He's a former youth worker and very experienced in those areas, and particularly those areas as well as the environment and social causes more generally. He was obviously re-elected in 2018, and he's going for a record third term in the seat of Pran. So all the very best to you both in the upcoming election. Thank you for coming here this evening, and particularly Sam, welcome this evening also. And David Davis will talk about when he gets here. So uh, as I went through before, We've gone through some of the ground rules about what we're asking people to do here this evening. You've got seven minutes. Use it if you wish just to put forward your uh, case in terms of why your party and your position is the best for the city of Port Phillip from a, a transport point of view. We would ask you to keep to transport as the topic. Obviously, it bleeds into economic issues and uh, environmental issues and social issues, but please try and keep uh, attached to the transport core focus. Once the seven minutes is over, you'll get a bell, give us a ring. You get a bell at six and then two bells at seven. There we go. Thank you, Greg. Um, that would be fantastic. Once we've heard from our wonderful speakers here this evening, it gives you, the audience, the opportunity to stand in front of the microphone. I'll ask you not to stand there until I ask you to do so, to ask your questions. I'll ask you to limit your questions to one minute. Um, after you've asked the question, if it's constantly repeat, uh, repeated, I'll use my editorial liberty to uh, perhaps speed things up a little and move on. I've also got some questions that have been submitted by our studio audience previously. So please come up to the agenda, we're, we're at the um, lectern rather. We've already done the draw. Nina, welcome again to the City of Port Phillip and thank you for coming this evening and thank you all for coming also. I use this one. All right. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge Elders from any other communities who may be present with us here tonight. Um, also to acknowledge the Mayor um, and Sam Hibbins as well. And um, 
the audience here. Thank you for coming out and the online audience as well. It's wonderful that you are taking an interest in something as important as transport. Um, obviously, I can't in the seven minutes, although I'm grateful for that, acquit all the matters that we need to, but I understand that we will have a pretty deep and profound discussion tonight, so that's wonderful. So first of all, I just want to touch on the Metro Tunnel 1. It's all about untangling the loop so more trains can run more often across Melbourne. The Metro Tunnel will create capacity for more than half a million extra passengers a week during peak times across Melbourne's train network, network I should say, and save up to 50 minutes on a round trip to St Kilda Road. The Metro Tunnel will create a new end-to-end -end rail line from Sunbury in the west to Cranbourne Pakenham in the southeast with bigger and better trains, next generation signalling technology and five new stations. Um, and that is due to be completed by 2025. Anzac Station, and you might have seen that beautiful canopy that is being developed as we speak. So construction on the entrance canopy, canopy at Anzac Station is forging ahead. Uh, this diagonally intersecting framework will be a distinctive feature of the canopy when looking up from the concourse level. The canopy is expected to be finished in around three months time. Below ground, the station concourse is taking shape with stairs and escalators now installed. Mechanical, electrical and plumbing systems are also being fitted out. When it opens, and this is really the clincher, Anzac Station will be the first in Melbourne with a direct platform to platform connection between the train and tram network, easing pressure off the busiest tram corridor in the world. And it's pretty profound when you think about that element um, along St Kilda Road. Zero emission buses. Um, our Labor government's commitment, $20 million, uh, three zero emission bus trials will inform the transition of around 4,000 diesel buses in the state's public fleet, including around 2,200 in regional Victoria to zero emissions. All new buses from 2025 will be zero emissions. Under the zero emissions bus trial, there are seven trials taking place across the state, which will involve 52 buses, 50 electric and two hydrogen. Um, these will provide practical information such as how electrical and hydrogen buses perform, the energy and charging requirements for different types of routes, noting, for instance, that when you have a depot where you are charging electric buses, it requires 25% more space than standard charging. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, the depot infrastructure requirements, um, currently Heatherton and Sunbury, are ideally suited for that. Um, others are landlocked. So these are things you have to factor in um, to when you are upgrading to this kind of technology. And an understanding of how zero emissions buses can improve financial and environmental sustainability and customer outcomes. The trial is also fostering vital local industry partnerships such as with energy providers and manufacturers that will need, be needed to achieve the transition across the state. Um, and I should say, which is a really good thing, most of the electric bus bodies will be built at Volgren's Dandenong South Manufacturing Facility in Victoria, supporting local jobs and injecting money into the local economy. Solar trams happening and there's more in that space. So Melbourne's tram network is 100% powered by renewable energy thanks to two Victorian solar farms. Um, this essentially uh, avoids, I should say, 200,000 tonnes of carbon emissions, giving Melburnians more clean energy travel options. Obviously taking public transport in the first place is incredibly sustainable of itself. Further, our next generation tram will feature onboard energy storage to limit current draw at peak times and reduce power use. The new trams will use 30 to 40 per cent less energy per passenger compared to an E-class tram by using onboard energy storage technology and regenerative uh, braking. And Yarra, Jam Yarra, Trams, Yarra, Jams, Yarra Trams recently flicked the switch on nearly 100 kilowatts of solar panels freshly installed on the roof of the South Pank depot, the first of seven tram depots to have renewables installed on site. What's the benefit of that? The 200 panel array will help power depot operations as well as feed into the network when excess power is produced. The seven depots will collectively produce more than 550 megawatt hours of power annually. I get excited about this stuff. It's the nerdy side of me, so forgive me for that. Ah, now, looking at extra bus services in Fisherman's Bend. Delivered more to come as we look to sustainable passive transport, as that is critical. The two major bus routes linking the CBD and Fisherman's Bend will get more weekday services, improving access to this growing uh, precinct. So you're looking at 10 minute intervals, which is far more convenient for people and also an incentive to take that method of transport. 
Uh, the government is delivering more frequent public transport services and better infrastructure to support development within this important precinct. Uh, the 2021-22 state budget invested in more frequent bus services on routes 235 and 237 in the weekday inter and off peaks to improve access between Fisherman's Bend and the CBD. And I note that that would be topical in light of some of the discussion we've had to date. Bus stops will also be improved at Salmon Street to complement the first stage of redevelopment in the General Motors site and the opening of University of Melbourne's new engineering and design campus. Bus operations at Southern Cross will also be improved. St Kilda bike lanes. Uh, St Kilda Road is Victoria's busiest transport corridor, which we've already discussed, and one of Melbourne's most active cycling routes. Um, it's also one of the most dangerous roads for bike riders and pedestrians. Uh, the Victorian government has committed a total of $30.5 million to build new separated curbside bike lanes that physically separate drivers and cyclists to make St Kilda Road safer for cyclists. Uh, over 300,000 people use St Kilda Road each day to drive, catch public transport, walk or cycle and to visit some of Melbourne's most iconic landmarks. Cyclists are more likely to be seriously injured by car dooring on St Kilda Road than anywhere else in Melbourne. So you can see that the imperative for these changes are really about safety at the end of the day and looking at the sheer traffic flow, and I mean all modes of transport along that corridor. So essentially we're improving safety for the 3,500 cyclists that currently use St Kilda Road each day by eliminating the risk of car doorings and re reducing the risk of crashes. So there's a lot more to go on that project, a lot more consultation, etc. Finally, you might think a little odd, I'm, miss, I'm going to mention level crossing removals. We don't have level crossings in, in the seat of our park, but I'll tell you why. Because when I've been out, you know, talking to people, people have unsolicited raised this issue and said how pleased they are about them. And I know that sounds really odd, but when you think about it, people who live in this seat don't only travel here, they travel to other parts of Melbourne and actually facilitates much easier travel and transport and saves people time. So I, I raised that. Um, we have been, re oh, and that's Thank you, it. Nina. I packed in as much as I could. That's Thank all right. You. Well done. <laughs> Round of applause, please, for Nina Tater. Sam, welcome to the lectern. Your seven minute starts when you do. Thank you for joining us. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. Can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on and pay my respects to their elders past and present and also put forward uh, my support and the Greens' support for treaty and truth telling in Victoria. Uh, thank you to the Metropolitan Transport Forum uh, for putting this on tonight and other forums that are happening right around the state this election to the city of Port Phillip for hosting. Um, you know, local councils really play a really important role when it comes to transport, whether it's delivery of transport projects around, particularly around uh, pedestrians and active transport, mm -hmm. local amenity, but also it's really advocacy as we've seen today from uh, Marcus. Uh, and, you know, Marcus, I think you are right. You know, transport really does touch on a whole range of issues, whether it's the livability of our local community, whether it's climate change, social justice, uh, reducing the cost of living. Uh, I come with a very clear message when it comes to transport today, uh, and it shouldn't surprise anyone. To tackle the climate crisis that we're facing, we need to tackle uh, emissions from transport. Transport is Victoria's biggest growing source of carbon emissions. Uh, it's roughly the equivalent to one of Victoria's coal-fired power stations, and by far and away the biggest contributor to this is uh, fossil fuel powered petrol cars and trucks. So to tackle the climate crisis, we do need to, at the heart of our transport policies, the state government does need to support people to make that shift uh, towards cleaner, cheaper, more climate friendly forms of transport. And I wanna put some ideas, some solutions on the table about how we might actually do that. Number one is a clear and legislated a clean transport action plan, a transport plan for Victoria that should cover all forms of transport and really outline a long-term direction that our state will go in. Uh, it should also set uh, mandated targets for emissions reductions uh, and mode share targets for the uptake of climate-friendly modes of transport. Number two is increasing the frequency of our existing transport network. We're going to hear a lot, obviously, about large infrastructure projects but equally as important is that we get the most out of the infrastructure we've got. Uh, I'll give you some examples. The Sandringham line, for example, uh, you're waiting about 15 minutes during the day for a service, uh, maybe 20 minutes on the weekend, and that's just not acceptable, uh, I think, for particularly for an inner city community. 
Uh, what I want to see is then cut those uh, wait times cut to around 10 minutes uh, during the day uh, and evenings and on the weekends. Uh, similarly with trams, uh, I was catching the number six today. Uh, that's a 12 minute wait during the day. Uh, the same with the 78 tram that goes along Chapel Street. These are just unacceptable wait times and a barrier for people actually catching public transport. I'd like to see those wait times uh, cut significantly. And we can do it with the infrastructure we have. It's just a case of increasing the amount of recurrent expenditure on public transport. Uh, the third idea I want to put on the table is rapidly uh, increase the uptake of electric vehicles. Uh, we have got some of the most uh, polluting, uh, climate damaging vehicles in the world on our streets and in our neighbourhoods because of our lax fuel standards here in Australia. And we are lagging behind the rest of the world in the uptake of electric vehicles. We need to make electric vehicles affordable for people, uh, firstly by abolishing the uh, Labor government's electric vehicle tax at a time when there are so many barriers to the uptake of electric vehicles, whether it's uh, the, the models available, the, the cost uh, charging, putting a, a, another a tax on electric vehicles, making them even more expensive, just does not make any sense. Uh, but we also need to increase the subsidies uh, to around, to similar to what they're having around the world, at least certainly in the near term, to around $10,000, uh, whilst, the, whilst the cost uh, at the moment that's about now the cost difference between an electric vehicle and a petrol vehicle, certainly over the next five to 10 years. The fourth idea is a massive increase in funding for active transport. That's walking uh, and bike riding. Uh, currently in Victoria, it's about 1% of our entire capital spending is on riding and bike and uh, riding a bike and on walking. Uh, and that really, uh, that, re that really is unacceptable. Uh, I think we need a much more balanced, uh, balanced approach to uh, transport funding. And that would mean far more separated bike lanes, safer pedestrian crossings, wider footpaths, more public space, better access to tram stops and train stations uh, for so many people uh, who need it to be made much more easier to be able to walk around our community, particularly people with a disability, parents with prams, uh, the elderly. Uh, you know, footpaths matter. You know, they really do. Uh, and I know that there's, uh, there's going to be a bit of concern about the rollout of pop-up bike lanes, which I'm sure we'll get plenty of questions uh, about uh, tonight, uh, but also the status quo, uh, what we have now on our streets really is not acceptable. Uh, locally, I want to touch on a few things locally that I certainly want to focus on uh, if I'm re-elected as the member for Paran. I uh, really want to finish the job down at South Yarra Station. Uh, we've got, you know, terrifically that we've managed to uh, get that uh, accessible uh, tram stop in. Uh, and the wider front entrance, we need to finish the job there uh, with a new northern entrance and pedestrian over, overpass, make that DDA access compliant and really serve that uh, growing Forest Hill community. St Kilda Road bike lanes have been advocating for them since I was first elected. Really, I, I saw a sign up today, I think that the rollout, they're actually going to get built very soon. Now, that's terrific. We need to make sure, not, not a moment too soon or too late, I could say. Uh, we need to get them uh, happening, see them through to completion, and then we need to move in other areas. Chapel Street needs to be the next cab off the rank. Uh, the rollout of more accessible tram stops, again, as I said, people with a disability, the elderly, people with mo mobility issues, uh, certainly is, is raised by, me, by uh, many of uh, tenants of public housing uh, that they need to be able to get on the tram, they need to be able to move around our community. Uh, we need to get that second entrance at Windsor Station. Uh, 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 the council uh, has uh, upgraded that, uh, the, the park next to uh, Windsor Siding, uh, and now they're ready to go and everything's in place now to just get that second entrance in there. Remove the Punt Road acquisition overlay, uh, follow through on what that independent planning panel actually said, uh, support that fantastic Green Line proposal that's been put forward by the community, and certainly I do support Metro 2 fast-tracking the planning for Metro 2 to get that going. So what I've put forward tonight, that'll cut emissions, it'll reduce the cost of living, it'll reduce air pollution, make it easier to get around and make our community an even better place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we'll now welcome David Davis to the lectern. David, thank you for joining us this evening. David was first elected to Parliament in 1996. He's one of the most senior and experienced uh, parliamentarians at the moment in the Victorian Parliament. He's been a former minister under the Bailey and Nathine government. He's also been a former shadow transport and transport infrastructure minister, so he's well versed on these issues and he's currently the shadow treasurer. David, uh, welcome to the City of Port Phillip. Thank you, Mayor, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and I think I see Andrew Bond. Are there other councillors here as well, or 
um, just the two. That's a good start in any event. Um, and if I can acknowledge the Metro Transport Forum and the uh, forums that they hold around the city, I'm always keen to engage, to hear from local communities. I note there's 44, I think, I count here tonight. So that's a good group from across the community. I also want to acknowledge Sam and Nina, my colleagues, and um, I should acknowledge to Lauren Sherson, the um, endorsed Liberal candidate, I think endorsed today. There you are, it's very recent indeed. So um, I'm pleased that you're endorsed for Elbert Park. Um, look, we're at a point where we've had a number of major impacts over the last eight years, but particularly over the last two and a half years uh, with COVID. The state uh, has gone backwards very significantly, huge debt, huge taxes, and often very little to show for it. Um, the state's debt, and you know, if you look at the Moody's report that came out uh, on Monday, the state's debt is a matter of real concern. It's officially 167.5 billion in 25, 26, but likely much more than that now with the interest rates surging up as they are. And that means we have to think carefully about how we look at transport projects, infrastructure projects more generally, and we've certainly been um, focused on how we get good value for money. And I think it's important when we look at the transport infrastructure projects around the state to note that almost every one of the new transport projects has got into real trouble. The state government has done these piecemeal. They've done them ad hoc. Um, there is no transport plan, and I agree with uh, Sam on this matter, and his party and mine have voted the same way in the upper house in favour of transport plan. It's a legislated requirement, and yet the auditor, when he looked recently, um, concluded the state had no transport plan. So if you're spending billions of dollars on transport infrastructure without clear principles, without an understanding of what you're seeking to achieve, you're bound to get yourself in some trouble. Um, I'm very critical of the government's management of projects, and I think when we talk about where we want to be with transport, there are major projects that we want to see done, but they need to be managed properly. They need to be scoped and they need to be held on track. If you look at the Metro, a good project in essence, but probably now more than $4 billion over budget. And $4 billion's just a lot of money. My former health minister, cost a billion dollars to build the new Peter Mac, the new VCCC. So you're talking about four of those for $4 billion. The Westgate Tunnel, similarly, is now more than $5 billion over budget. Level crossings were mentioned by Nina. Now, again, a good idea, but all of them over budget. The government won't even tell us the price of finished level crossings more than 60 completed, you'd think you'd know how much they cost. They won't say. I'll let you work out why you think that might be. Um, so no transport plan, massive cost overruns with most of the projects, a lack of focus on things like electric vehicles, and I agree with Sam, electric vehicles are an important part of the future, an important part of managing greenhouse impacts, and yet we have no realistic plan here. We have a new tax um, and we have intrusive record keeping arrangements and we have a lack of points for people to connect. I was talking to someone in Stonington today and they, they talked to me about range anxiety. This is a suburban person with an electric vehicle we should, be, we should have been able to do much better on some of those key, key points. I should say too, um, there's a number of key points I guess I want to make. You know, the Fisherman's Bend tram, it was our view that there needed to be a deep train station 
in Fisherman's Bend. The first act of the new Labor government in 2014 was to stop that. And now we're eight years later, eight years, and there is no transport at Fisherman's Bend. There's none. It's eight years. It's a long time to sort of be whistling Dixie down the, down the track. It's an ideal that Labor had, but they've never delivered nothing. Um, we've made some announcements about transport too. We think that the state's government's proposal for the Box Hill to Cheltenham line is flawed at this point. We think the project should be shelved and we've been quite clear that the billions of dollars being funnelled into that project should be redirected into our health system. Massive problems in our health system, our triple zero system, our waiting lists are now near 90,000 and that needs to be dealt with. So we've said that money from that project will for the time being be redirected into healthcare. It may be at a future point that that is relevant, um, but um, I just, I, I think it's an important priority for the state at the moment. Um, happy to talk about the many other points, but, you know, transport infrastructure is important. The quality of the transport system is also important. Safety, security and reliability. And our system at the moment fails on most of those, particularly on the reliability um, index. If you look at the performance, even with very low numbers, uh, they haven't done well. Thank you, David. Round of applause, please. Thank you, everybody. That was fantastic. Now's the opportunity for you to ask some questions. So I'd ask those of you that are keen and eager to start making a little cue behind our wonderful microphone here. I'm going to ask, give this microphone here to James if you've got some um, accessibility uh, issues or you'd like to start, remain seated, that's perfectly fine. Just wave at um, James and he'll come across with a, wave, uh, a roving microphone. Now, just a quick reminder of the ground rules, one minute to ask a question and the key word there is question. We want a question, we do not want a statement and I'll be a bit brutal. If you've watched me in a council meeting on a grumpy night, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, you're, then we have our speakers have two minutes each to respond to that question. There may be situations where perhaps Kay asks only Nina a question and a response really isn't required from the others and I'll make a due judgment in terms of whether or not those sort of situations arise. If the other speakers do wish to speak to an item, just um, give me a wink or a wave, please. Uh, if you could, no, just state your first name and um, direct your question. Kay, welcome to the City of Port Phillip and I'll get you to start off. Thank you, Matt. Um, Kay O'Connor, I'm from St Kilda Junction Area Action Group. And for many years we've raised with the City of Port Phillip our serious concerns about safety issues at St Kilda Junction for commuters, pedestrians, cyclists and motorists. In March 2020, there was the tragic death occurred of a young female cyclist as she was transitioning cycling through St Kilda Junction. September 21, uh, we provided to Major Roads Group Victoria, uh, at their request, a presentation of what those serious issues are that we considered. And um, the uh, Major Roads projects are, are still to come back with us. With, okay, we've with only got a minute, so what's the question? Uh, last May, we were informed that the Victorian Government has invested $3.2 million in continued development of the St Kilda Road bike lanes. What is the plan for those bike lanes in terms of transitioning through St Kilda Junction? Uh, when will it be um, provided to the community and when will it be implemented? Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with Sam, then we'll go David, then Nina. Sam, over to you. Well, I think that's a... Can everyone hear me? I think that's a very good question because I know that's something St Kilda Junction and I know is something that uh, JAG has been passionate about for many, many years now. I think this is probably not the first uh, transport forum that this has been raised. Uh, and what, uh, in terms of St Kilda Road bike lanes, what has been disappointing is both it's been a very long time since they were first announced, I think the last during the last election period, and we still have not seen a published design uh, put out there uh, whether that's on St Kilda Road or the transition to the junction, it's been incredibly frustrating. 
it's taken far too long. Uh, those, not only should have those plans been out and put out to the community for consultation, the thing should have been done by now, quite frankly. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, Kay. I'd love to know just how exactly are they going to manage St Kilda Junction, which itself needs its own master plan and own, uh, own special uh, view of that to see how that junction can actually work properly. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. David? COVID safe. <laughs> it's working. Yep, there we go. Um, Kay, as you know, this is an issue that I think is quite important. We do actually need a proper master plan uh, for Secure Junction itself. Turn it on. That... Why don't you turn it on? Is it on? Yep. It, it's a, uh, we, we actually believe there should be a proper master plan for Secure Junction itself. Um, and the, inter the interrelationship with the bike lanes has got to be sorted out very clearly. Um, I know the junction is a mess. It's not pleasant in the way it's structured, and it's, as you say correctly, it's not safe. It can be done a lot better, and that requires the application of thought and engagement with the community, and it will cost money too. But if it's not some proper master planning process, it's going to be higgledy-piggledy. So that's our, our view about how it should proceed. Thanks, David. I should just say there was an FOI we put in, which the government fought bitterly on this too. Um, and we did get some information in the end, but we don't have a complete picture. Okay. Great. Thank you, David. And Nina? Yes. Thank you. For, oh, that's working. Thank you for the question and also for your passion for uh, this particular uh, project. Um, so I'll just repeat one line, but I'll get to the crux of what you're asking as well. So the Victorian government has committed to a total of 30.5 million to build new separated curbside bike lanes that physically separate drivers and cyclists to make St Kilda roads safer for cyclists. Um, and cutting to the chase here, um, bearing in mind we also, and I think this is an important part of the planning, is respecting that heritage aspect in terms of the um, aesthetics of the road. That's not, but that's not going to your question, but I just wanted to say that's an important aspect too of preserving those elements. Um, so the St Kilda Road bike lanes project will, develop, will deliver separated curbside bike lanes that physically separate vehicles and bicycles, coming to your uh, question, along St Kilda Road from Linlithgow Avenue to Dorcas Street to Rack Road to St Kilda Junction. Uh, we're undertaking further planning and development work for the section of St Kilda Road between the Junction and Carlisle Street, investigating the safest and most cost-effective solution for this complex intersection. Um, and, you know, this includes options to minimise impacts on parking, access and traffic movements as well. Noting uh, what a complex uh, space that is that you know very well. Um, and uh, I should say, Rail Projects Victoria is building separated curbside bike lanes between Dorcas Street and Turek Road as part of the Metro Tunnel project. So I'm excited that um, the you know early works are starting shortly and um, this is kicking off and there is the commitment of the money. I know you're wanting specifically the junction, but let's get this project started and then we move our way down. Well, with respect, um, watch okay. the transition through the junction. Good question. We might take that later on. Kay, I'll just get you to take your seat. Thank you for your question. Adrian, welcome. Thank you. Get the state your question within one minute. That'd be Adrian Jackson from Middle Park. Um, as somebody who's lived in Albert Park Electorate for 40 years, I think uh, Albert Park Electorate is well serviced. Oh, I'll take this off. That's okay. Well, well, well serviced by public transport, at least for us able bodied people. Now, for the people with wheelchairs, uh, there's a problem with buses. Uh, so what, you get, what they're going to do about that? Um, okay. And uh, I think when the, um, the train lines were converted to tram lines, we've got more tram stops. I've got one near my house, for example, on the 96 line. So, so I think it's all pretty good in our park. And you've got the interstate, in, within the state, transport from, from um, uh, uh, Flinders Street Station I've been to Sydney on the train, day train, and it was terrific. 11 hours, I don't know, without all the hassles with the uh, airports. All right. Thank so you, Adrian. Good, good, good question. So um, particularly around accessibility is important on the buses, but um, also you might want to make mention of some of the trams also. So first now is David. Go ahead. This is actually quite an important point, Adrian, and I thank you for raising it. It is clear that 
more needs to be done with accessibility. We're a long, long way behind on trams, and the recent report of the auditor made that clear. Um, but we're also a long way behind on buses, and it is going to take money and resources and a focus. Um, but there are economic benefits as well as clear social benefits. So I think your point is well raised. Thank you, David. Nina? Um, yes, so I'll, I'll speak broadly to this, but I'm happy to follow up with you individually as well, because I can see this is something you're very passionate about to do with the, it's the bu accessibility of buses. I'll just say broadly that um, we have a $90 billion investment in transport infrastructure through the Big Build initial initiative to see how a pipeline of work is making a generational improvement. Going to your point about a full and, and comprehensive recognition of the fact that accessibility is actually key to also more people taking public transport as well. Um, and when we're talking about accessibility and amenity across the uh, transport network, and you notice that new buses that are being built, and I spoke to that a little bit in my speech as well, are catering to uh, the needs of people who, um, you know, need better accessibility as well. Um, I'm happy to follow up with further information specifically on bus network and what was the other part of your question there was there were two limbs to it I, weren't there I basically said that the conversion of the train line train line more, more, more train he was paying you a big compliment on the tra public transport that's in, lovely you know, i will take that on, on yes. successive <laughs> governance <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, Sam, yeah. I was going to crack a joke. Yeah, but look, I won't. accessibility Sam, about, of our public transport system. Uh, I currently, I, I don't think it's up to scratch right now. Uh, the fact is that so many people, uh, whether they're using the wheelchair or have got mobility issues or just parents with prams, you know, they can't get on the bus, can't get on the tram. Quite frankly, often walking around the footpaths, uh, it's not great either. It's quite difficult, uh, and it's just it's unacceptable. Uh, and really, if we're going to have um, a more inclusive society. Uh, if we're going to have a transport system that works for everyone, well, accessibility must come to the fore. Uh, if there's the, the disability, we're not compliant with the DD Act, DD Act, which supposed to, we said we're supposed to have a, uh, an accessible tram network by, I think, the end of this year. That's going to be by, at the current rate, it's going to be end of 2060. Uh, it's just not acceptable. It's been neglected for far too long. Thank you, Sam. It's also important to note that the city is very eager to work with the Department of Transport on upgrading the required infrastructure, particularly power infrastructure, to ensure that we get those new generation trams onto our tram lines that would allow um, accessibility to be better facilitated through that infrastructure. Welcome. Thank you. Andrew from uh, the Drop Punk Community Group. Hey, Andrew. This is a, a question to uh, all three presenters. Well, now two, because uh, Sam has stated his position or the Greens' position on uh, the lifting of the Punt Road uh, public acquisition overlay. I'd just like to ask the other two uh, presenters what their party's positions are on the lifting of the uh, overlay, given, one, the uh, advisory panel in 2017 came down and said it should be lifted in almost its entirety. The state government uh, then completely rejected the findings. Number two, uh, the UN uh, Committee on Human Rights has stated that any reservation over 10 years uh, is a violation of people's human rights. This reservation is 66 years old. It's older than Elvis. Uh, we want an answer. We deserve an answer. We believe we uh, prosecuted the uh, our case and won and uh, we basically lost on a uh, on a, a captain's call after the siren. Great. Thanks, Andrew. appreciate that. Nina, you're up first. Sure. Um, now, I may not uh, be able to uh, give you the answer you're perhaps seeking tonight, but I will give you an honest answer, and the honest answer is the Department of Transport is continuing to do work on the Punt Road Traffic Corridor Study. So that's about where I have to land with yes. you tonight. Even um, that's four years okay. later. Let's let Nina answer the question. We're done. That, that's fine. Uh, Sam, obviously you've got a, a potential leave pass if you wish to take it, but please feel free to... <laughs> oh, no, but I mean, that overlay is there. It's based on a transport plan from the 60s that is completely out of date and unneeded. Uh, the government is just kicking the can down the road. I mean, with this um, punt road um, plan or strategy that has not seen the light of day and has been complete, keeps getting pushed back. 
uh, really that acquisition overlay needs to go. Even Vic Roads took about four go four goes before they could actually get widening that road to stack up. It just really need, it just really needs to go. It's out of place. Vic Roads can't have acquisition overlays uh, and um, have uncertainty for communities for over 60 years. It's just outrageous. Thanks, Sam. David? Um, Andrew, as you know, I understand the background of this very well and worked with your group closely in our commitment prior to the last election, which still stands, that we should remove the overlay. And the fact is, as shadow, former shadow planning, I was very aware of the details and followed closely the panel hearings and the submissions that were put to the panel. It was a persuasive set of information put to the panel. The panel, the umpire, if you will, made a reasonable set of decisions and you know you, I, I think essentially the community got about 95 percent of what it had asked for and we've said that we would support the panel's decisions and you know it is a matter of fairness um you know and it is a matter of proper process too great thank you david thank you, and thank you andrew we also now how, now know how old elvis is which makes us all feel a bit older thank welcome you. how are you hi thanks marcus nice. uh Thank you, representatives. Uh, my name is Justin Halliday. I'm a member of a um, community alliance who, uh, sorry, an alliance of community groups who've developed a proposal to activate the uh, Sandringham line between South Yarra and Balaclava. This proposal is called the Green Line. The idea is to activate it as a nature walking path, uh, biodiversity corridor, and uh, co-located cycling facilities. Um, this proposal um, envisages a loop almost uh, from, you know, encompassing the Shrine to the Sea, the, Yarra, the main Yarra Trail, down the Sandringham Line, and then back along Elstonwick Canal, back to the, to the beach. Um, my question to you um, is, what is your party's commitment to active transport projects like the Green Line and other ones, I think you indicated, Sam, as well, you know, uh, cycling and walking amenity, when we have a, a larger commitment to, um, you know, 15-minute cities and moving people away from vehicles um, and getting them more active. Great. Thanks. Question. Uh, great question. Thank you, Justin. Sam, you're up first. Yeah, sure. Um, firstly, on um, more broadly, I mean, as, as I said before, we absolutely need much more funding towards active transport, riding a bike and walking. Uh, we've seen in uh, currently in Victoria, it's around 1%. Uh, in uh, Scotland, where the Greens are partners in government, it's around 10%. In Ireland, it's around 20%. That's a significant amount of funding. Uh, we also need much more funding for biodiversity uh, as well. And I think those two areas is why I think uh, the Green Line is such a fantastic uh, idea. We all saw uh, during a lockdown just how important uh, nature, local nature, our urban environment, our streets are, and to be able to transform our streets uh, into usable, uh, environmentally friendly, uh, good not just for people but for you know animals and birds as well. Uh, it's just the sort of thing we should be doing to improve our urban amenity. Great, thank you, Sam. Off to David. Um, Justin, can I just say your project is a great project and it's supported by our party, um, particularly David Southwick, my colleague, who is um, a very firm advocate and talks about your group to me all the time. So. Um, you know, I, I think the points he makes are, are right about the nature of the project, about not just active transport, but actually, as Sam has said, about the green uh, aspects of it. We need canopy, we need um, proper um, use of public land. Um, if I can be very critical, and this is actually, you uh, know, this is not a partisan comment, it's about VicTrack, which is a body that has um, existed and holds all the rail and, and um, transport assets across the state. It is a, um, I'm looking for the word here, it is a, um, let me just say it's a law unto itself. It is a, a body that needs to be brought into line. It's a body that needs to work in the community's interest and um, nothing could illustrate that more clearly than the resistance that is there on the Green Line. And if we're in government, we will crack through that and make sure it happens. Thank you, David and Nina. Um, yes, so um, I know that we've discussed the Green Line uh, project, which is a very exciting project. There are a lot of really interesting elements and it's wonderful to see the passion that you have for that. Um, and so uh, I don't have an answer for you in terms of how that would be delivered or what could be delivered with that yet. 
However, I'm um, very happy to follow up with relevant ministers, and I think it would take a number of ministers because it covers in other um, areas, but I will come back to you on what the possibilities may be with that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, definitely excited about following up on that and pursuant to concepts. I mean, I'm stretching a little bit, but like Shrine to Sea, where mm -hmm. we've already seen 150 trees planted and then um, there's going to be significant improvements to biodiversity um, in the local area. So, and I think that's sort of thematically in that zone, but I'm generalising because obviously there are a lot of intricate elements to each and every one of the rail corridors, but um, certainly will be very interesting to look at what scope there may be in that space as well. Um, and look, we do have um, significant um, walking and cycling programs and um, active uh, transport um, investments across the state. I've already talked about the St Kilda Road bike lanes um, and safer CBD cycling connections. Um, we would be here a while if I list them all out. Um, and we also have a number of commitments that have gone over a number of years and continuing now to active transport per se. Um, I'm happy to pursue with you as well. And every major new transport project from North East Link to Westgate Tunnel now includes new or upgraded infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, and uh, we also, I should say, with all the level crossing projects, you'll, I'm sure you'll notice that there, these are also further opportunities, which also lean in a little bit to your concept as well, to mm. building biodiversity around those rail corridors, but also active places where people can, um, you know, play basketball and other things as well. Right. Uh, much more in that space. Thank you, Nina, and thank you, Justin, thank for the you. question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and Council also stands very much ready to provide a, a large body of information to any candidate that would like to know more information about some aspects of that project also. Welcome to the City of Port Phillip. Hi, thank you. My name's Simon Baldwin. I live in Port Melbourne. Um, I feel lucky to be the first person to raise the pop-up bike lanes uh, at this meeting. Uh, excuse me while I read. Um, in light of the recent backlash against trialling these um, bike lanes and safety improvements in the city, uh, how can state governments better support councils and residents in ensuring trials like these are, can be more successful in the future? Thank you for the question. Uh, David, you're first. So bike lanes and active transport is important more generally, but it also matters how it's implemented. You have an extremely arrogant government a government that actually rides roughshod over local communities wherever it goes, whether it's, you know, um, level crossings, the northeast link, um, the Westgate Tunnel, whichever one of these you point to, there are massive suburban rail loop, all of them, there are massive backlashes from community, those who are impacted, and very often it is because the government is not consulted properly. Uh, we disagree with the um, binding rules that are put in place with a lot of these, um, where councils and communities are required often to sign confidentiality agreements that actually block them and prevent them from consulting properly. We're, we're, we're just deeply opposed to this approach. You know, often you'll have a councillor or some officers who are on a, a consultation committee, but they're actually bound by these confidentiality agreements that prevent them consulting with the community. And you, you, you scratch your head and say, really, how can that be in this modern age? Well, it is. One of the consequences though, when you act in this high-handed way and you roll over communities and you don't listen and implement carefully, is you get bad reactions and backlashes. And my answer is very simply that part of this is about a proper process. It's actually about engaging with communities and actually dealing, you know, I, I talked to city restaurateurs the other day, and when the when the lanes were put in in the city, the bike lanes, in some places they were put in a Great. way that they Thank couldn't you, actually bring trucks in. Nina, oh, yes. Thank you for your question. Um, so there are just a few aspects I would say to this, um, and one is um, obviously they're on council roads, and the whole purpose is actually collaboration between council and DOT. Um, and um, so there are a few points that I wanted to raise with regard to this. I'm just thinking where I might start. Ah, yes. So we know the Department of Transport has worked in partnership with Council on the pop-up bike lanes program from the development stage through to design and construction. 
Um, this included providing the council with detailed designs of all routes on local council roads for review and approval prior to any construction, as is usual for council roads. Um, and the Department of Transport continues to work in partnership with the council in this trial through the evaluation period. Um, now, I, I, I won't labour the actual consultation that has taken place. I, I'm happy to speak to that if you want, but I, I think you'll, it sounds to me like you're wanting to look prospectively on where this is headed. Um, obviously, there have been a proposal on adjustments that have been put forward uh, to the City of Port Phillip, and I understand that tomorrow night um, that these will be considered, and so if they are if we want a better word, accepted or embraced by council, then those changes can go ahead. But rather than railroading council, we actually, I mean, we would actually like council to have the opportunity to discern and read through them and, you know, and make the decision there. So um, I'd, I'd probably go a little contra to some of the propositions that have been put forward. And further to that, subject to what council decides, because the timelines will be subject to the timeline of council making that decision, is that there is actually um, communal uh, communications, co-branding, so that they're truly collaborative moving forward. Because that it is council roads, we don't want to be saying, you must do this or otherwise. It is, has been from the start about collaborating, but it very much a trial, and hence so many changes can be embraced if council accepts them and takes them on. Great. Thanks, Senator. And Sam. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I want to say a few things about the pop-up bike lanes. Um, number one, uh, the government's program has come far too late. What, this, what was happening around the world, particularly during 2020, uh, where more people were riding their bikes, more people were walking around the communities because of lockdowns, is governments were going in and putting in this pop-up infrastructure. The government waited far too long uh, to actually start putting in that, in that infrastructure, you know, over years too, years too late, quite frankly, when the, 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 the critical mass was really there. Uh, the second thing is the main game in terms of bike infrastructure is separated bike lanes along major thoroughfares. Um, local, local routes, important, of course, but they're not necessarily the main game. And again, to generate that critical mass of cyclists, you want those separated bike lanes along those main routes, like St Kilda Road, uh, Chapel Street, other, other main roads. With the, 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 with the pop-up style, the idea is that there's supposed to be some you know, cheaper, um, potentially movable infrastructure that you can put in, uh, you know, see how they work uh, over a period of time, then make changes if need be. So certainly, uh, I've known some of the designs are quite unique, uh, and certainly I think there, there can be scope for improvements, but I don't necessarily think we should be going in there and wholesaling, you know, ripping up or ending the whole program. So if we're going forward, what I'd really like to see the government do uh, is again focus on these separated bike routes along major or in major uh, bike thoroughfares. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Welcome. How are you? Um, I'm Julie Clatterback from the Port Phillip Bicycle Users Group. Um, both people who currently ride bikes and also the car lobby, the RACV, have called for a network of safe cycling lanes. And here I'm not speaking about paint splashed on the road, but proper protected lanes that separate drivers and cyclists. Will we commit to building the strategic cycling network in the next term of government in, in partnership with local governments as appropriate? Thanks, Julie. Yep. Nina? Nina, you're up first. Sorry, did I get... No, Sam, you're up first. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Misplaced um, my own system. Sam, thank you. Sorry, Nana. Well, as I said earlier, we need a massive, significantly increase uh, the uh, amount of active transport, investment in active transport, um, and that will deliver, you know, we need hundreds, hundreds of kilometres of separated bike lanes across wider metropolitan Melbourne. Uh, I think if you delivered that as a single project, like some of the these other government projects, like a, you know, a metro tunnel or a freeway project or what have you, that would stack up better against any other major project in terms of uh, improvements to um, congestion, uh, the health benefits, uh, the urban renewal benefits. Uh, and certainly, rather than this piecemeal approach where, uh, let's face it, you know, just a small amount of uh, money is expended on bike infrastructure each year, it takes forever just to get a separated bike lane going. We need considerable investment and that vision of, as you say, that network approach, and it would stack up against any other transport project in this state. David. I didn't hear your name clearly. Sorry, Julie, Julie. Julie Clutterbuck. Julie, sorry. Um, look, we're sympathetic to expanded bike provision across a um, broad front. 
um, where that's done thoughtfully and in proper consultation with communities. We think one of the things that's got stuff into trouble is, you know, sort of very um, bureaucrat driven decisions that are not actually focused on what local communities are wanting and needing. Thanks, David and Nina. Uh, yes, so um, I wasn't sure how far and wide you were wanting to go with that question because I know we'd had a little discussion about active transport uh, you know, policy across the state and, of course, that policy stands, so I'm not vitiating from that and it's very much about um, incorporating in our major projects but also with something I've already discussed tonight, which is um, the St Kilda Road bike lanes, which will be the uh, what you're referring to, the uh, separated bike lanes between pedestrians... And, oh, sorry, cyclists and the road. Uh, sorry. Cyclists and cars. Who am I? Yes. Anyway, um, so I think I'm really excited about this going ahead. I mean, I don't think that probably have different perspectives on what is a large amount of money. $30.5 million to me is a fairly significant amount of money and a significant investment and a critical one when we're looking locally. Um, I'm ha happy to discuss further with how far and wide you're talking because I know that our uh, cycling strategy covers across the state. It's not only localised, but for the purposes of City Port, of Port Phillip, I was going to focus more on what is pertinent immediately to people who need to transit in and around um, this space. But um, definitely uh, very much a concerted effort on the part of our government to make sure that cycling and, you know, essentially low carbon transport is enhanced across the state. Thanks, Julie. Appreciate you coming tonight. Now, we're doing pretty well with time, but if we can keep it quite succinct, I think we'll get everybody in because we've got sort of 15 minutes to go. So we started a little late, so we'll go a little over, but welcome to the City of Port Phillip. Mark Norton, Middle Park. Um, two subset questions. First uh, concerns the lack of um, tram um, access on Park Street, South Melbourne, between Kingsway and Moray Street. I think Beatty's Indian Restaurant, you'll understand the area I'm talking about. So I say that in the context of Metro 1 and Metro 2. And the uh, more important question is, the, uh, is the, the dirty words that are going around this municipality at the moment, and they are pop-up bike lanes. There's 38 kilometres of them. And uh, my question for each of you in relation to that is, what do you understand about the risk assessment work that's been done in relation to those pop-up bike lanes? Two, what do you say about them visually? And three, would you be surprised that this community will definitely be making it a very significant issue at this forthcoming state election? Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. David, you're first. So two questions and three sub-questions on the yeah, second one. Yeah, so it's actually quite a bit, Mark. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm happy to be educated about the specific location that you're talking about. And um, I'm happy to actually come out and have a look at that with you and try and work through the, the details of it. And, um, you know, I think sometimes it's better to look at these things on site. In terms of the um, broader issue of bike lanes and um, access like that, the risk assessment, I'm not sure what risk assessment they've done. I think often the processes are inadequate, as I've, I think I've made clear. Um, and I think we've got to treat these as major pieces of infrastructure, to the extent I agree with um, Sam, and that means proper assessment proper business cases, proper understanding of what the impact is on um, people nearby, including traders. Um, so I, to the, the extent that you're saying, has there been proper risk assessment? Um, I think often the answer is no. And that's a subset of the poor process that I think we see. Uh, in terms of the visuals, I think they often do look very ugly. And um, I think we've got to think about better design um, Good design is a is a you know a significant outcome if you if you actually invest the thought and the time and the focus in 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 that and you're saying you're going to make it a major state issue um, and I say good luck to you and well done that's entitled you know we're a de democracy and people should be able to have their say and I, I welcome that thanks David Nina. Thank you for your question as well. Um, so what I would say is firstly, based on community feedback um, and the continual evaluation process of, and I'll get to the heart of your question shortly, um, DOT um, is proposing a number of changes which I think you would be well aware of um, and subject to what council agree to. Um, and 
and I understand that there was significant community feedback about, in particular, bollards and perhaps the orange and so forth. So I, I get that as well. I think perhaps if I can say this as objectively as I can, rather than it being my opinion, I think what the community has thought about is probably what is most relevant in terms of what has been taken on board in terms of uh, community feedback, noting it is a trial and hence that is why you didn't have a longer term element to the design in terms of the bollards, et cetera, being of a temporary nature. Having said that, fully accept that, you know, a significant number of members of the community that didn't like that particular design. So that's 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 fair. Um, now, what, uh, now I've, I've got on a little track there. I was imagining the bollards and I've got to answer your other elements of your Risk question. Risk assessment. Risk deal. assessment. So my understanding is, but happy to be corrected, that risk assessments would have been undertaken before these uh, particular, the particular trial was put in place. Happy though to triple check on that element for you if you would like after this, but that's my understanding. As I say, I'm happy to triple check that element, but I think before DOT roll out these kind of um, uh, projects, they, they have to go through various governance procedures and processes before they can do that. You may think otherwise, that's fine, that's okay. Um, and what was the third element? Park Street tram. Oh, Park Street uh, tram. We're out of time anyway. Oh. No, uh, thank you, Mark. Tim, welcome. You want me to? Sam. Oh, Sam. Sam. Sorry, yeah, sure. um, it was bound to happen. Okay, sorry, Sam. we'll probably have to probably speak outside about the um, that other location, the Park Street tram, and what have you. But uh, just in addition to saying about what I've already said about the pop-up bike lanes, um, yeah, I mean, look, the idea is that they're of um, a pop-up, temporary of nature uh, design that then allows you to assess and then look at, you know, how it can be changed. Uh, what could be improved, what could be made better, and what should be there in the long term. So that's the that's the process. So I understand there's a lot of feedback, but that's the idea of the, the, the temporary or pop-up nature of the bike lanes itself. I would also say that when it comes to cycling and safe cycling and making sure that, you know, we've got a community where it is safe for kids to ride to school, it is safe for everyone to be able to ride a bike or walk around our community, the status quo also is not unacceptable. So I appreciate there's some concerns about the very, you know, very different nature of some of the pop-up, the treatments and what has, have you, but I certainly think they should be continued to be looked at and see see how can they can be improved. Think, think concrete think, sleepers. Thanks for Thank being brief. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I was just about to suggest 90 seconds, but you, I've been brought into 60 seconds. So um, candidates will move into 60 seconds if that's okay. Uh, that doesn't mean speak faster. It perhaps means speak slower with more intent. Tim, welcome. How are you? Good. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, my name is Tim Norman, and I'm here representing the Beacon Cove Neighbourhood Association of roughly 500 members of that association. I'm not going to talk about... Oops, say that again. I'm here representing the Beacon Cove Neighbourhood Association and representing the roughly 500 members of that organisation. I'm not going to talk about bike lanes. I'm going to ask you about Fisherman's Bend for those who know the geography, Beacon Cove is immediately to the south of, of Fisherman's Bend. And we share the same roads when we want access to the city or we want access to the freeways. In fact, I make the point that all of the people in here being residents of Port Phillip would actually, to get access to the freeways, come up through the north. There's three entrances there. There's Todd Road, there's Montague Street, and there's the Kingsway. So all of the people coming through from Fort Pillip to want access up there. Great. Use that. What? And you're asking for the support of the project? Or? I'm, I'm asking, that was a quick minute, but okay. Um, I'm, I'm asking specifically what the uh, parties would do to speed up better access uh, uh, th through the roads through there. We've got... Okay. Yeah. All right, Nina. Okay. I probably I was trying to um, trying to get to the heart of your question. So specifically, what is it you're wanting? And I'm sorry, it was a little bit of back feed, and I, if if I may, Marcus, quickly, yep, oh, sorry, very I'm, quickly. I'm, I'm extending it, aren't I? Sorry about that. There's there's about four thousand new residents there, roughly two thousand two thousand five hundred new cars, and not a bit of new infrastructure aside from extra buses. Okay, thank you. Ah, okay. So um, you're talking about the overall uh, transport planning for that, for Fisherman's Bend. That's what you're yep. wanting to know more about? Ah, good. Let's get to the heart of your question. So um, I think you might be aware that the 21-22 state budget included $15 million over two years to continue planning, development and protection for transit corridors um, within Fisherman's Bend. So going to your question about 
how do you improve in that space? Um, so we're investigating how we can best serve the precinct and will progress our planning and development work to ensure we can meet transport needs for decades to come, understanding just how critical it is. This includes planning for land acquisition and... Oh, Great. Thanks, Nina. Sorry. That's OK. Um, Sam, you're up next. Sorry, we're a bit speedier now. Well, I mean, I just think of, um, you know, we've heard the stories of those, uh, you know, estates that are built on the outer suburbs of uh, Melbourne where they haven't put in the infrastructure that was promised by the developer, you know, they haven't put in that interchange and the kind of nightmare that would create. Now, you know, times that by 10, 100 and put that on Fisherman's Bend. That's what that's what the issues you're facing unless that the early um, public transport Metro 2 and the tram works to go in, don't go in. Uh, either first or, or when uh, Fisherman's Bend is really starts humming with development there. There's a real, um, it's a real challenge. I can see what's a priority for, for Port Phillip. Uh, I think we're, we've seen the mistakes of when you don't do the infrastructure first, can't make that mistake with Fisherman's Bend. Great, thank you. And David? Um, so I, I would agree in part with that. I think you do need the planning to and the infrastructure to go with the um, population and the new growth. Um, but your point is not just Fisherman's Bend, it's Beacon Cove as well, and the fact that it's not got the proper transport. We say you do need proper transport planning. Where is the planning for Metro 2? Why is there no planning for a station uh, nearby that actually has good connections through into the whole of that, um, of that pocket, including Beacon Cove. So I think your points are well made. I'm happy to share with you your organisation and FOI we put in that, again, was bitterly fought by government um, and the attempt to actually find out some of the material about transport and transport links into Fisherman's Bend. Um, we, we think, again, eight years this government has been in power and it has actually not delivered a ZAC into Fisherman's Bend or Beacon's Cove. Thank you Beacon very much, Nina. No, Sam went first, right? I did. What am I doing? Terrible job. Oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. My name's Yarm Salako. I'm a Kilda resident. Um, I'm a keen cyclist. Um, and my question is uh, for Nina. Uh, it's about pop up bike infrastructure. Um, I just wanted to correct a few things that you said earlier. First of all, um, there If we can get been, the question... Well, I'll just line to preface, preface my question with this. Um, I think you said earlier that these, um, these pop-up uh, bike lanes or the infrastructure have been designed in collaboration with the council. That's not the case. Uh, the community or the council, uh, either officers or the council laws, were not given details of the design of the infrastructure which has been installed. Um, okay, I'm, and what's the question? My question is, uh, first of all, I want to know whether you support the infrastructure that's been put in place. Uh, and secondly, uh, will you support a, a process, an open community process of consultation about the infrastructure which has been installed? And will you commit to, uh, to uh, removing it if the community Great. is not in favour? I'll allow the question because we've had quite a few on pop-up bike lanes, but I think, Nina, if you're comfortable answering that. Um, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Forgive me. Um, of course, it is a trial and that is absolutely an authentic statement and you can take that on board insofar as obviously there are many changes that are being put forward um, and are subject to council agreeing to them uh, will be implemented, and I know that DOT have already been investigating even the weather ahead of time to anticipate what timelines, etc., would be um, required in order to implement those changes. So just to say that that is all being taken very seriously. We can agree to disagree on, you know, what information has been provided or otherwise, because, um, yeah, I just have to go with what information I have been provided, and I trust that that was provided in good faith. Um, but having said that, it is a trial, and the whole purpose is working collaboratively to make sure and that um, that changes that are put forward by community, as have been to date, um, can be taken on board. And I should emphasise um, that it's actually based on community uh, feedback and continual evaluation Thanks, that the changes Nana. to date are being can right. be implemented subject to council agreeing to. No, thank you, Nana. I appreciate that. And I won't go to the others because we've covered off on this already. Welcome. How are you, Guy? Hi. Um, Just move a little Guy, bit closer to the sorry. microphone for Guy us. Guy Boston. I live in Middle Park. I've been a very proud um, Middle Park and City of Port Phillip resident for over 20 years. And 
My question is, how on earth did these pop-up bike lanes with okay. orange bollards, chunks of concrete and big yellow lines end up in some of the quietest streets of Melbourne? Our community is devastated. And to say 95% of people are absolutely pissed off well, okay, that's very, enough. It's very no, conservative. No, we were okay how, up until that point. No, no, happen? we're done. No, no, we're done. That's great. So we've covered off on bike lanes fairly substantially. We, we, we've covered off it already. I'll allow to go around. We'll, I'm not using that language and that aggression in my town hall, so I'm drawing the line. No, no, so I'll allow you to have some more comments. But I, but I think you No, no, David, David. Sam, if you could go first in response to where the concept came from, if you have any contacts, and then where S Sam, David, Nina, go ahead. Use the microphone. If you could. Sam, microphone. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, look, in terms of if you're looking at the genesis of pop-up bike lanes themselves, I mean, this has been something that's been happening right around the world, um, particularly once lockdown and COVID hits, government's been putting them in. As opposed, in terms of the actual treatments, you know, the yellow lines, the concrete bollards, however... That's completely uh, Department of Transport and the, the, the state government. Uh, that's 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 their their sort of parameters, and that's what they've they've put in, um, and that's where that's where we're at. Thank you, Sam. David, uh, I'll be brief. You need a proper process before you do these things. You actually need to talk to people, councils, and communities, and this hasn't happened here. And this is typical, as I've said, right across the city with all of these transport projects. They're actually imposed from on high. Um, and it's, it's frankly the wrong way to go around things. And you get perverse and bad outcomes when you do that. In terms of the actual visual amenity, as I said just before, they're ugly. And, you know, I, I think this is, again, a reflection of the fact that you've got a group of bureaucrats in the city, sometimes instructed by the minister, um, and they go ahead and think that this is a wise thing. Well, it's, it's nuts. OK. All right. I, I agree. I agree. And... and, and um, there, there should. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Nuts. Okay. Great. Thanks, David. Nina. Um, if you wish to add anything. Well, uh, certainly. Um, you know, I take on board the comments that you're making, and I'd probably take them as comments, and I, I respect that completely. And and this is a perfect forum to be able to share those sentiments. And um, you know, community feedback as such as that has been um, expressed um, and the continual evaluation process is enabling changes to be taken on board and certainly Nelson Road, well, you would be already aware, um, is included as part of those changes. So that's what I would say. But genuinely, the goal is to have a collaborative process all the way and continuing. We done? Great. Okay. Welcome. So we're a little coming to the end. So we've got about five minutes remaining. So I'll do my very best to get through the questions. But if they're, uh, if they're a pop-up bike lane question, it has to be two standard deviations different from what we've heard previously, OK? Go ahead. Welcome. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Josie Budden. I'm a Port Melbourne resident. This is not a question about pop-up bike lanes. Josie, was Yeah. Not Josie a question thought. about pop-up bike lanes. Uh, many students in Port Phillip choose to commute by bicycle or public transport, yet many local schools lack safe bicycle infrastructure or effective transport in connections. Particularly in regards to the new Fisherman's Bend precinct, how do you consider the needs of student commuters through primar of primary through tertiary education, and is that a priority for your parties? Great question. Uh, first up now is David, then Nina, then... Uh, OK, so I, again, I'll be brief in the circumstances and make the point that, um, look, we, we, we just need proper ways to um, implement these things. And, you know, it's clear across the municipality that there aren't the connections to schools and so forth, and, and there should be. There should be sensible connections there, and um, I don't know why we can't actually develop proper plans across municipalities long-term plans that actually put in place these things. Eight years, you know, they've, they've done nothing in the, in, in the, the, the sort of that whole band of fishermen's bend. They've done nothing. Um, we could have actually had a much better outcome. We can. Thanks, David. And Nina. Well, first of all, I'm very glad that um, you are 
you know, very passionate, and I mean that in the best sense, and I hope it doesn't come across in any way patronising. It shouldn't. This is what we want to see, more people who want to use low-carbon transport. Um, it's definitely the cheapest way to travel and much better for your health and much better for the environment. And certainly uh, I, I can speak broadly that this is incorporated as part of the planning, and I'm advocating strongly for as much of that low-carbon transport that you're talking about as possible. So um, the more you push for it, the better it is. So please keep pushing for it. It definitely um, has to be factored in, um, and I understand that already is. I'm, I'm not... Uh, well, anyway, suffice to say, you are spot on that this is essential if we're going to have truly multimodal transport and to reduce congestion over the longer term. So no disagreement with you. Thanks, Nona. Sam? Yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah, look, we should have a community where kids and par kids' parents feel safe for their kids to ride to school, feel safe to play on the streets. Everyone should feel safe to ride a bike, whether you're you know, a kid going to school or whether you're 70, 80 years, years old. That's where we should be actually trying to get to. Uh, and we can do that by having far more funding going towards active transport, riding a bike and walking, not 1%, uh, but 10 or 20% of the infrastructure budget. Just to add a little bit from a council point of view, where we've written to the Department of Transport regarding the Port Melbourne Secondary College, I'm working closely with them, particularly areas of concern of Beacon Road and um, the areas coming into Williamstown Road and the surrounding areas around the Secondary College. So we're working with the Department of Transport to try and get a better design and implementation outcome for safety very, very quickly. There's only 80 or so students at the school at the moment. Um, those safety concerns will increase as the numbers increase. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank I appreciate you. it. Campbell, welcome. Thanks, Marcus. Campbell Spence from Middle Park. I have a question about uh, the Sea to Shrine project. Shrine to Sea. Shrine to Sea project. Earlier this year, um, residents uh, were concerned about the uh, installation of a separated bike lane in Kerford Road and the removal of two lanes of traffic. They were concerned about uh, traffic being di diverted from a major arterial road. What's the question, Campbell? To, to um, back streets. The question is, um, there was a petition taken up uh, and, and the pop-up bike lanes were stopped for Kerford Road. The question is, what is your policy on the future of the Shrine to Sea project with respect to removal of two lanes of traffic? Thank you. That's uh, Nina, Sam, then David. Um, so I'm probably particularly excited about the biodiversity and, and improving those elements of the Shrine to Sea project. It is absolutely too early in the project for me to be able to speak about those elements because there is so much committee consultation that has to take place before anything happens in that space. So I'm not going to say X or Y now because we are not at that point, absolutely. So just to reassure you, we need significant community consultation before that proceeds. Thank you. Sam? Um, look, I actually do think there needs to be a separated bike lane along that route, and whether that's through another another avenue or um, removing removing a lane or another another way it can be done. You know, I was really disappointed that that was removed from the pop up bike lane because the idea of the pop pop up bike lanes to put them in and then assess how they work, assess whether there was going to be you know too much congestion or would have been traffic along the, the local street. So I'm disappointed that was removed, and I think it should be included in it. Great, thanks, Sam and David. And look. We've, I've certainly had a lot of representations about this issue and some pro, but some very concerned about it. And again, I think these processes are not right. And the government, I think, has again uh, not, not got a lot of these points in the way it should have. And, you know, you actually want to deal with the precise details of narrowing and lanes and changes. Um, you actually do need to talk to people, and I don't think that happened in the right way. Thank you, and thanks, Campbell. Um, and we'll just take those two final questions. That'd be fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alison McCormack, CEO of Bicycle Network. Active transport is clearly an important topic of this election. Um, and internationally, we have seen such progress on bike lanes, and if you build them, people will come. But the savings and the time that it takes What's for someone question, to travel Alison? into the city is um, definitely not only a active transport issue, but also a health and a climate issue. In terms of spend on active transport, what percentage of infrastructure spends would you commit 
to active transport, okay. as Sam has suggested, and a specific local issue with Fisherman's Bend and the Melbourne University coming into Fisherman's Bend. Mm -hmm. What is the connection between Melbourne University and the, and the campus at Fisherman's Bend to get Kelly people Cops. safely Thanks, there? Sam. Kelly um, go ahead, we're Sam. Gonna, we'll have um, uh, some more announcements in terms of what we'd like to see in terms of bike infrastructure funding. Uh, later on during in the campaign. But as I've said uh, before, Greens in government in Scotland, it's at 10%. Greens in government in Ireland, it's at 20%. So it is absolutely significant. And I would simply just put it this way. You know, if you look, if you're building a city from scratch, you know, you obviously wouldn't do it without a road network or, you know, a, a, a metro or a train network. Uh, you wouldn't do it without footpaths. You shouldn't have a city without a network of separated bike paths in a modern city today, especially what we know about the benefits for health uh, and particularly our climate as well. Alison, you make a, a lot of very good points, but the first one of the first things I set up at the podium before is that we actually don't have a statewide transport plan. And actually, a lot of this is being done ad hoc without proper thought and without proper coordination across um, the, the state. And I think that a key part of a, a state transport plan is actually making sure that there is a proper place for active transport. And, you know, I think you, you make some very good points, um, but we, we actually do need to ground a lot of this. The local cock-ups that we've seen happen have happened because there's no overall structure and because bureaucrats are told, go and do that project, and they just go and do it without talking to anyone. And, you know, actually, these things are about people's community. They are actually about where they live. Um, and, and there is obviously trade-offs to be made, um, but they've got to be made openly and with honesty. Great. Thanks, David. Nina? Um, yes, so broadly speaking, uh, we do have policy in place already. Uh, safer CBD cycling uh, connections, St Kilda Road bike, la bike lanes, which I've already alluded to, uh, the Active Transport Victoria, new paths on new projects, strategic cycling corridors and Victoria's cycling strategy 2019 to 228. Um, as for specific <coughs> percentage, I'd have to, I'll have to do some research on that and come back to you on that. I, I won't wangle out a figure out of the air, uh, but certainly um, respect that, um, in encouraging more people to, and, and also cycling safety, you know, and minimising the risk of car dooring, et cetera. Those various ramifications that poor cyclists have to encounter are um, incredibly significant and paramount. So thank you for raising the issue. Our last question. Thank you for joining us. I'm Annie and I live on St Kilda Road. Hi, Annie. Um, uh, on St Kilda Road, the park, car parking is going to be uh, removed um, from Kingsway further down into the city uh, in order to put a park lane there. So I'm just wondering, is replacing the car park on, on St Kilda Road to facilitate bike lanes and cyclist safety more important than the safety and amenity of the thousands of residents who are living along St Kilda Road? Taking the, taking the car park away car parking away means that inability to for services to access the apartments, inability of uh, older or disabled people to get into cars if they have to get across a bike lane and a car or cab has to stop in the main roadway, that becomes a particular safety issue. There okay. has has it been considered any so the your question is the why the car park's being removed. Yeah. Do you support them being removed and are they being removed at the yeah. trade-off of, of uh, bike there, infrastructure? When there is an alternative okay. method of removing no. the extra tram line. That Thanks, Annie. So it's David, for. Nina and Sam to finish off. Uh, Annie, I think you raise very good points. Again, this is a balance that's got to be struck and it hasn't been struck very often openly and honestly. It hasn't been a, a, a process that's actually seen communities consulted and I'm aware of a number of the parking issues that in the in the vicinity that you're talking about and you know it's actually quite impactful on people and long term long term the government has not provided any solutions for people so you can't you, you know remove people's ability and access without actually talking to them engaging with them and providing long-term solutions for some of the problems that are created. And 
I, I, I think this is where it's got to be. We actually have to have an honesty about what's being proposed. It can't be imposed from on, on high um, with a minister just, you know, by fiat saying, do that road, we're going to do it, and you just go and do it. It doesn't matter if anyone Thank you, David. is told or talked to. Nina. Yes, thank you for your question. Oh, there you are. Um, so with the particular uh, direction that is going to be undertaken with the curbside bike lanes, um, the curbside bike lanes, so just speaking to the design elements and to try to get to the heart of your question there, um, they want to ensure consistency with the bike lanes being delivered as part of the Metro Tunnel Project and protected bike lanes built by City of Melbourne as part of its St Kilda Road bike lane plan and transport strategy 2030, stay with me. Uh, maintain access to properties along St Kilda Road, so that is a priority. Provide a safer cycling experience for people of all abilities. Uh, result in loss of fewer overall parking bays along St Kilda Road and minimise impacts on other forms of transport along St Kilda Road, including priority movements of trams. So I hope that's trying, I'm trying to get to some of those key elements because there are a hell of a lot of intersections along that corridor. And I should say at the heart of this, the project has been designed to minimise the amount of parking loss with the curbside lanes resulting in significantly less parking loss compared to the original design, which would have involved Great. building centralised lanes. Sam, is it? Yeah, look, this was an issue that I've actually gone and met with residents on site and had a look and discussed with residents as well. And I think particular issue here was that some of these uh, older apartments don't necessarily have service access from the, the rear. And so, of course, you've got delivery delivery vans and what have you needing to pull up out, out the front. So I don't necessarily think it's the separated bike lane uh, that's the sort of the, the devil here or it's the thing that needs to actually go to be able to facilitate that. Uh, I'd certainly have written to the, the minister and sort of planning that whole Anzac precinct. Uh, to look if the what scope there is actually to allow for delivery vehicles to actually make those drop-offs uh, at those uh, older so older apartments where the access to the rear just isn't possible. Terrific. Um, thank you, everybody. Now, you've got a group of highly swing voters here that with their votes up for grabs, I'm sure. So you have 90 seconds, each of you, to give your best pitch to why they should vote for you, your party and your policies. We'll reverse the order we opened in. So, David, you'll go first, Sam second, and then final, finally, Nina. Um, David, I'll hand over to you for your 90 seconds. Thank you, Marcus, and thank you to my colleagues, and thank you to the forum for arranging this tonight. Um, look, transport is a critical part of our future. And we need to be in a position where, where there's population growth, and we've heard of that in, in, in a number of key locations in the municipality, um, where there's significant population growth, there needs to be the transport infrastructure that follows that. There hasn't been. There's actually been a real shortfall. And where there have been major projects, they've been poorly planned, poorly coordinated, uh, with no uh, overarching uh, focus. Um, so I say proper planning is a big part of it. I also say proper engagement with communities and councils indeed. A key other point is that huge amounts of money are being squandered by the huge blowouts on major projects. $30 billion in blowouts is actually where we are with transport projects in this state over the last seven and a half years. $30 billion and the thing is ticking and going forward. That is a huge amount of money that if those projects had been properly run, properly scoped, could have been spent on a range of other worthy projects. It's driven the state into debt. We've made some very clear promises about um, transport projects around the state, and we'll have more to say. Um, on the suburban rail loop, we've said the money there will be reprioritised and we've said that the, the money will be put into health care. That is a key uh, focus for us. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming uh, tonight and thank you to my fellow parliamentarians and to Port Phillip Council and the, to the MTF as well. Um, look, I think what we've seen is how just how important transport is to our community, uh, our state and really the direction of the state and where we actually want to go. Uh, we need uh, to tackle the climate crisis. We do need to cut emissions from transport uh, to improve social justice, uh, local amenity, uh, access. Uh, transport is all a key part of that. What I've put on the table to tonight certainly is the Greens plan, the Greens vision uh, for a legislated uh, clean transport action plan. Uh, increasing the frequency of our uh, existing public transport, particularly throughout the day and on weekends, increasing the uptake of electric vehicles, 
a massive investment in the uh, funding for uh, walking and uh, riding a bike infrastructure that is so important, uh, plus a number of key uh, local initiatives as well, like further upgrades to South Yarra Station. More Greens in Parliament. Well, that means we can push the next government to go further and faster in cutting transport emissions. We need a strong voice in Parliament, in the heart of Parliament, for climate friendly, for affordable, for accessible transport. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Nina. Right. Um, so thanks again to, for everyone to, uh, coming out tonight. One thing I will say, you can't sit on your hands and hope congestion will go away. You actually have to take action, and that's exactly what our government does. That's why we've removed 65 level crossings. We've got another 10 to go. We are a party of government. It takes a party of government to actually deliver major infrastructure projects, such as the Metro Tunnel, such as Anzac Station, zero emissions buses, separated bike lanes, um, and we have to be accountable. Solar trams, and now we're moving to trains as well. You can't have these major infrastructure investments unless you are in government and we have major and long term planning and implementation to make sure that the projects are implemented appropriately. And let me tell you, nobody is complaining about any level crossings that have been removed to date. Um, in fact, we get uh, approval. And I should say as well, we have those greater frequency of buses, 235 and 237 uh, for uh, transiting between Fisherman's Bend and the CBD as well. I'm very much looking forward to the rollout of the uh, St Kilda Road bike lanes. I'm a strong advocate uh, for low carbon travel. I have a strong record for that over many, many years, and I even travelled to Holland to see how they actually converted to low carbon travel there as well at my own expense. Um, and I would have to say we are the most progressive government in the country. We are proud of it, so stick with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, round of applause to our candidates. We did this forum here this evening slightly different from previous years because we wanted a whole of city approach rather than just a fisherman's bend approach, which is what that usually happens when we just focus on the seat of Albert Park. And our city is blessed to have wonderful local representatives at the federal and state level. Uh, and you've seen that on show here tonight. Each one of these three people uh, give up their, their lives in many respect to represent you um, from different angles in different seats in the state level. But we uh, thank you all for your service and we wish you all the very best for the upcoming election. Now, if, you, if you, you've had a taste of this evening and you want to have a look at what else we've got on offer for the advocacy items, go online, uh, just Google Port Phillips State Election and you'll see what is my, I feel like it's attached my hand at the moment because I'm constantly advocating to anyone that will listen to us for our state government, uh, state election advocacy items. There's one, some wonderful projects here um, at the um, big level and at the small level also that our candidates can review uh, as part of their policy positions. You're all a wonderful group of solid citizens. We appreciate you coming here this evening. If you want to talk more about pop-up bike lanes, there's a council meeting tomorrow night and I won't restrict any of the questions. You can ask as many questions as you like about pop-up bike lanes tomorrow night at the council meeting. Our candidates will hang around here uh, to answer any more of your questions. Just before I move on, just get the candidates that are standing in the state election also to stand up. Um, Georgie Dragwich, who's an independent candidate for Albert Park, welcome. Um, Lauren Sherson, who's representing the Liberal Party in Albert Park, welcome, congratulations. And I don't think I missed anyone else. Hello, welcome. C congratulations and welcome and thank you. So again, thank you for coming this evening. You're welcome to have a conversation with me, any of my colleagues in terms of fellow councillors and the candidates. Um, I'll see some of you tomorrow night. Thank you and good night.